good afternoon, everyone. And thank you once again for the opportunity to speak at such an important conference for the gold industry and at one where so many producers and investors are in attendance. Today, I want to talk to you about the main factors that should influence gold through 2024 um, and how I see those factors developing. Uh, firstly, gold does enter 2024 as a relatively high performing asset, especially in uh, uh, cross currencies. Gold did well and rose towards the end of last year as those twin sisters that guide gold prices, real yields and the broad dollar, US dollar, fell from last November onwards. <clears throat> The angry nephew, geopolitical risk, was also positive for gold, sadly, after Hamas attacked Israel in early October, and subsequently another Iranian proxy, the Houthi rebels, started to threaten shipping in the Bab el-Mandeb at the entrance to the Southern Red Sea. I'll talk about that to some extent later in the presentation. All along in the background, central banks um, put in another huge year of uh, gold demand Demand that often matched and occasionally exceeded on a quarterly basis total world investment demand. And that helped gold higher, particularly in the face of the relatively high real rates and the US dollar in the early part of last year. Together, these factors all came together to provide the fundamental impetus for a powerful end to the, for the year and a powerful beginning to this year. <clears throat> what then of 2024? And what is the likely pathway for those factors that affect and influence the gold price and, of course, all asset markets. I'll generally cover only those factors that I can think I can make a, a sensible, sensible narrative out of. And also, I'll look at things largely through an American lens, because it's still the world's economic locomotive. There's a strong first-in, first-out argument with regard to rates policy. And I think that many of the difficult calls that the Fed has to make are relatable to other central banks. Now. <clears throat> Everyone widely accepts that interest rates will fall across the world, most of the world, in 2024, after a very rapid departure from the ultra-low rates in the COVID and indeed the pre-COVID era. And that's as the threat of inflation appears to go away and an easier policy, uh, an easier policy setting becomes appropriate. Looking at the decline in headline inflation, that looks pretty reasonable. Whilst the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the Personal Consumption Index, has fallen fast on a year-in-year -year basis from a high of about 5.6% two years ago down to 2.93 at the time of writing, other, index, and other indices are ticking higher and indeed overnight year-on-year uh, -year CPI beat expectations. It's worth looking at the following charts and just asking yourself how rapidly rates are likely to fall in the face of re recent strong economic data. So, for example, non -farm, U.S. non-farm employment changes shocked everyone in January with a rise of 335,000. <clears> U.S. prime age employment is back to where it was pre-COVID, and that's a really strong number. And crucially, U.S. financial conditions are easing even through the period that the Fed is actually tightening rates. So. <clears throat> Both this is the, uh, the Fed, uh, Chicago Fed measure of uh, financial conditions in America and the Goldman Sachs measure. And that's really doing some of the Fed's work for it because you're getting policy tightening, but conditions appear to be easier. <clears throat> so that, that sort of takes away, if you like, some of the, perhaps some of the impetus for the Fed to, to, to ease uh, rapidly, against the, which is the sort of narrative that they're coming out with. Also. Lower rates are likely to be challenged by the fact that this year we'll see significant issuance of US debt, estimated around about two trillion US dollars. And in order, to, in order to sell that debt, yields are gonna to have to be bid up along the curve. And that's gonna work slightly against the narrative of, of a rapid decline in rates. The main point here is to be aware that the theme is lower rates, but it's all about timing and expectations. And 2023 was very much about getting ahead of those expectations and getting ahead of intentions. And I think that's likely to happen this year. So that's something to be conscious of and aware of. Um, in fact, when I summarized where Fed rates were probably likely to start falling from and how far they're likely to fall, it actually looks very different even just a week later. So that gives you an idea of just how volatile people's expectations and understandings are. So to give you an idea, last week, the idea that the Fed would tighten in May was more or less baked in. But the drop from there was also fairly richly priced, that the rates would fall by 150 basis points. Now, looking at it today, May is definitely still the jumping off point, 
but the actual likely fall is much more strongly balanced towards uh, 100 basis point to 1% fall, not 150 uh, basis point fall. And that's a really, really dramatic change to take place in the space of you know, just four or five days. Overall, as get rates fall though, the gold market will be a beneficiary of those lower rates. Now, <clears throat> the US dollar is facing quite an uncertain year for a bunch of reasons. Um, the yield gap has risen slightly after recent statements by the Fed and recent economic data, which I referred to before. But it had been the case that projected falls in interest rates were likely to be larger than the Eurozone. And of course, the Bank of Japan is really likely, I think, to exit its negative interest rate policy in April of this year. Um, Governor Ueda and his uh, number two have been busy preparing the ground for that outcome for the last sort of month or several weeks, and it's been widely expected. In fact, it was expected even before now. But April looks like a fairly likely time, and that comes in before the Fed actually begins to loosen. So on balance, that looks like um, that implies a weaker US dollar. However, there's always a however. The political environment contains plenty of uncertainty, both domestically and internationally. And as a safe haven asset, the US dollar responds well to that uncertainty. On the domestic front, a Trump presidency contains the possibility of sharply higher and substantial traffic, uh, tariffs on imported goods, particularly those from China. And the threat of those certainly would tend to keep the dollar higher, and certainly the reality would as well. Also, should richly priced US equities decline significantly for whatever reason, perhaps as the outcome of a completely unexpected trade war, for example, then that would be another impetus for a higher dollar. So additionally, <clears throat> cycle analysis, which I quite like, uh, implies a stronger dollar. Now, out of sheer um, laziness and not looking at things very closely a couple of months ago, I actually got into my head that the cycle was going to end in about April or May. But in fact, when I re-ran things on the same length of cycle, it looks like the uh, bottom came in for the dollar, at least on a cycle basis, in January of this year. And that implies a certain kind of uh, tailwind coming from, the, from uh, uh, the cyclical benefits. So where does that take uh, the broad dollar? Well, targets go up to 108 and 110 in the medium term. And that implies you know, something fairly strong. Given where we are today, that's not a huge call. But I wanted to look at something that would be meaningful over the course of this year. Now, central banks, again, like I said, over 1,000 metric tons of buying last year, 1,000 metric tons of buying uh, the year before that. Um, there's plenty to like about gold in the official sector. It's liquid, and it's without liability. It's a proven store of value in the longer term, and its performance is augmented at times in times of uncertainty and fear. Also, the general trend towards government debt issuance in an already highly indebted world makes it a natural alternative to adding more bonds and notes from foreign, other foreign central banks to your international reserves. The most important takeaway from central bank demand is that it's largely or relatively price insensitive, so it's a good shock absorber in the presence of rising real rates or a rising dollar. And my expectations that the dollar might strengthen overall in 2024 would then be mitigated by good official sector demand. You can see just how big it is there. Now, China is the absolute standout consumer of gold last year. Mainland consumed 910 tons of gold. It's about a fifth of all total world demand and about a quarter of all consumer demand. The 16% growth in physical demand year on year almost certainly reflects a degree of post-COVID re reopening. Importantly, is Chinese demand likely to be replicated, is likely to remain high during the coming year? I believe it will for a number of reasons. Firstly, positively speaking, Investors are likely to add to a winning trend. Gold and yuan ended up last year 15% on the year. Secondly, the behavior of alternative assets, well, not, not alternative, but the alternatives, competing assets, has been abysmal. The Shanghai Shenzhen 300 stands at about 85% of its value at the beginning of, in, in January 23. Now, the central government appears to be positioning itself as the buyer of last resort. A major wealth management firm, one of many, but major one, went bust last year. <clears throat> and the products that people sell, or that wealth management firms sell, they're opaque, and they're either implicitly or explicitly geared towards the property sector, which of course is doing badly. And at the epicenter of all of this, the most important part of the household balance sheet, which is property, is still in trouble. And I think it's likely to remain so, despite efforts to change that. Now, before I show you the next slide, 
Unlike Australia, China faces a significant overhang of property, whether built and un unsold or unbuilt. It's enough to represent another 12 Melbournes, and I think if my calculations are right, house the population of WA about 50 times over. So I've done a little graphic to represent this. And it's like one of those little solar system things where you compare Mercury to the size of the sun. The red, the red is unsold property, and the blue and the yellow is just all the property in Australia. So it gives you an idea of just what a, um, a sort of a difficult situation they're in. Additionally, regional banks are thought to require about the yuan equivalent of over $306 billion of recapitalization, depending on the degree of stress within that sector. So supply fundamentals, the shrinking population, youth unemployment, and a government, a dirigist government that appears antithetical to the interests and the benefits of the private sector are all stacked against a recovery. So given all the challenges that, main, that face mainland investors, you can see the appeal of gold. It's tangible, it's debt-free, it's liquid, simple to understand, and it's got a great history that they can refer to. So for all those aforementioned reasons, I believe that gold demand will remain high in China unless there's a substantial shock to the capacity of households to save and spend. Now, I'm just going to touch very briefly on geopolitical risk. And I'm aware that I could make a comment that's immediately challenged by changing events. So I stress it's not a prediction. But it's more to say that sometimes you should take the longer view about how these things play out. Post October the 7th, it's notable that Middle East relations have proven more durable than some had expected. There is to some extent because violence by Hamas and Houthi rebels has only served to reinforce the reasons why Arab states are slowly converging on recognition and bilateral arrangements with Israel. Both parties recognize a common threat, and that threat has only become more starkly apparent. That's not to present a blithely optimistic take on a terrible and intractable situation. It's just to say that there are forces and events that push towards chaos, but there are also centripetal forces that tend towards order. Now, having said all these good things about gold, I have to talk about targets and timing. Targets in this intensely denoised and long-term chart suggest on the upside 2360 and 2580 in US dollar terms. And if you plug those numbers, those strikes, into an option calculator, what you get is, as of two days ago, um, what you get is a one in four chance of gold going to 2360 or above by February, of 20, February 25 next year, or one in five in nine months' time. And for the higher target, 2580, one in seven in next year, one in 10 this year. So the nearby target is not totally off the cards, and it gives you a sense of what, how the sort of crowdsourcing in the financial markets is pricing those probabilities. So, fortunately, I'm not behind time. <laughs> um, I would just like to summarize by saying gold should enjoy continued support next year, or this year, this coming year. There are good reasons to expect strong demand from the official sector and from China to continue. I haven't discussed India at all, but Indian GDP growth forecast at 6.8%, it's reasonable to expect decent consumption from that giant. And indeed, if strong GDP growth isn't matched by productivity growth, then domestic inflation will also be a positive for gold, uh, gold consumers locally. Rates are, of course, are likely to decline. The more important element is what real rates do and whether in inflation is allowed to ride a little bit. Investors in the West are under weight in gold, so they can bring more ammunition to the party should the gold price rise. And technical indicators are positive. Physical demand in Asia is excellent and continues to be post-Chinese New Year. And lastly, the tribulations of the mainland Chinese economy are likely to put pressure on the Australian dollar, which is positive for Australian gold producers and positive for Australian gold investors. Thanks very much for your time and attention.